Good evening. I'm Pastor Clark Olson Smith. Um, welcome to worship. It's good to worship God together as together as we convene right now. As we begin these great three days um, celebrating Jesus' uh, life, death, and resurrection, um, just a couple of announcements. Um, tomorrow, Friday, we will have two worship opportunities, one at noon on Facebook Live and again at 8 um, over Zoom. Uh, look uh, into your email inboxes for instructions, especially about the second Zoom service, and then we'll be back together uh, here on YouTube at 9.15 a.m. on Easter Sunday morning. And what I hope that we see and experience in these three days is that crisis. Uh, it was a moment of crisis uh, for Jesus, for his disciples. Um, and even more than that, his whole ministry was a moment of crisis for the people of Israel, that we can find the comfort um, of, of Jesus in the midst of the crisis that we face as a nation now. Um, you know, it is at the heart of crisis, even at the root of the word crisis is crux or cross. And I hope you see it there blazing. I hope you see it reflected in these baptismal waters, blazing out the light of Christ here. Um, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let's pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave us his own body to eat, his own blood to drink. Awaken us to the truth that we are what we eat, Christ's flesh and blood presence in the world, and give us the eyes to see Christ in everything and everyone, even betrayers and deserters. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Gospel according to Matthew, the 26th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening, Jesus took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Really, I'm telling you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed, and they began to say to him, one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. And Jesus answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread. And after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, because this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I'm telling you, I will never again drink the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night. Because it is written, I will strike the shepherd of the sheep and the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Glory to you, O Christ.
So I have a confession to make of the, uh, the dog ate my homework variety. My first sermon that I recorded with Maureen in the church building disappeared. Uh, that video is gone. My computer ate my sermon. And so that's why I'm here at home <laughs> speaking to you again. I blame Maureen, actually. She jinxed us. She said we actually had a glitch during communion, too. We lost a bit of that video, we, but we noticed it right away. We fixed it uh, or did it over. Maureen said, well, at least you got your sermon. Well, Maureen, I lost that, too. But not Maureen's fault, not her fault. It's, this is part of the, the, the painful learning process that we are all in right now. Now, crisis has kind of been my theme for today, this day, Monday, Thursday, um, in part because the medical experts are saying that this is the heart of the crisis for us. This week, maybe the week or two to come, when we will see the most death, it could be the worst week of the outbreak. Maybe we can be comforted uh, it, right now as uh, the, the crisis deepens, that we see the crisis deepen in Holy Week, um, and that we can trust that Holy Week is a story about God's deliverance in times of crisis. I mean, just listen later when we do the, the prayer during um, communion. It tells the story, you know, from exile in the garden, to the crisis of the flood, um, to the crisis in Jesus' own time. I don't know why God's ministry is almost entirely a response to crisis. Maybe it's because that's when our hearts are open. Um, I know that um, in the last few weeks, um, you've been texting me, even calling me, letting me know um, how much these services have meant to you, even reaching out to musicians. Um, and I'm grateful for that and humbled. And I know it's not about me. It's about how all, all of our hearts have been opened um, in this time to be more aware of God, who is here all the time and present with us all the time, but so much more maybe evident to us now. I mean, in Jesus' time, his ministry from beginning to end was um, in a time of crisis um, in Israel. I mean, regular people were dealing with Roman oppression, with religious leaders who sided with the oppressors, who interpreted scripture and framed God in, in that oppressive frame. Um, people were living under crushing debt with starvation and illness, and then comes Jesus, healing, feeding. You know, so much of what Jesus was doing was renewing community life in Galilee. He was going from village to village and calling those communities back to God, back to each other, um, providing what they needed. And then when that phase of his ministry was, uh, had come to an end, he went to Jerusalem to, to hold leaders accountable in that capital city, accountable to God, accountable to the scriptures, accountable to the suffering that they were causing on the margins in Galilee. I mean, we're at the heart of our crisis and when we come to this Last Supper table to hear this Monday Thursday story, we um, are also at the heart of the crisis of Jesus' story. I mean, just put yourself in the place of those disciples. Even as they're sitting down to eat together, they could feel that crisis. I mean, Jesus had been voicing it all along. Um, telling them things that they did not want to hear. You know, foremost among them was that he would be arrested, rejected, crucified, that he would be put to death at the hands of the, this corrupt and faithless religious political system. Jesus voices it. 
brings us into the calls us into the reality that uh, we have been wanting to avoid. And even here at this Last Supper table, the crisis is worse in Jesus' words. One of you will betray me. All of you will desert me. Oh, what did that feel like for them? Maybe we are feeling a bit now what that felt like for them. I mean, the truth is, for, for them, for us, these are crises of our own making. I mean, part of the message as Jesus went from village to village, I mean, in the biggest picture, was we all had a role in creating this mess, and we now have a role, all of us, our own role in cleaning it up. I mean, I think about that now um, from the point of view of this pandemic. Maybe you have had these same feelings of like questions, even in the moment, like, am I doing the right thing? I mean, the moral thing. I mean, am I risking as much for the neighbor as for myself and my family? Am I valuing my own well-being as much as I value the neighbors? But there's a bigger level to this. It's not just the individual, but also the corporate. The corporate, is, which is part of the problem that we've created this crisis, is ignoring that corporate, communal, the care for the whole. I mean, we live in a society that's so full of short-term thinking, where we calculate a bottom line that excludes the thriving of most people and certainly excludes the thriving of all creation. We have this, as a culture, this wishful thinking, a denial of death, a denial of other consequences, and we just seem to lack a certain sobriety and a discipline, but also compassion and a hopeful imagination. We're so tribal and divided. As long as me and my tribe, my team wins, my my political party, my race, my whatever. We created this crisis. Experts have been warning of a pandemic since 2000, since the George W. Bush administration, and yet here we are, not prepared for this one. I mean, I've heard a story, maybe apocryphal, about the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic. And it goes like this, that after that pandemic, very little was written about it by the people who actually experienced. There was very little voice given to that experience. And the explanation that I heard was that people were so guilty, felt so guilty and felt so ashamed about how they had acted, how they had responded to that crisis, that they, without even discussing it or coming to an agreement, just wordlessly decided, we're not going to talk about that. But here we are in Holy Week at the crux of everything, the cross, the heart of the crisis. And the promise is that the heart of the crisis is what God does to turn the worst things into the best things, to turn death into life, to make sinners like us, to transform us more than forgive us, forgive us, yes, and also to change us into people who can do what the time and what God asks of us. I mean, my favorite part of the gospel that we just read was that very end part. Um, it was when Jesus says to his disciples, after I am raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. What's so 
amazing about this and so counterintuitive is that in the, in the very breaths before this, Jesus was saying, one of you will betray me. All of you will desert me. And then the very next thing he says is, I will go ahead of you to Galilee when I am raised. I mean, Jesus is saying that his resurrection will be their resurrection. I mean, he's paving the way for, for them to return to him, for him to come back to them. I mean, just think about this. What good is it if Jesus is raised and if he waits alone in Galilee because his disciples are paralyzed in Jerusalem, paralyzed by that trauma, by that guilt, by that shame? And so it's almost as if Jesus is pointing out what will happen, both the good and the bad, both their, the disciples' failures and his resurrection. Jesus lays that all in advance, brick by brick paving the way for them to come to him, to trust that he is trustworthy, that it is love and not vengeance that they, he will give to them. This is the truth that sets us free. I mean, the only kind of truth that sets us free is truth that serves love, because love liberates. And it's God's love on the cross. Again, forgiveness and more. Change. We are being changed as people. I I, I believe that. I'm not sure what that's going to look like. I don't know how I'm going to be different in six months or a year or the 18 months that I'm hearing it might take for us to come back to some kind of sense of normalcy. I don't know how I'm going to be different. I don't know how you're going to be different. I don't know how St. Paul is going to be different. But I'm holding on to the hope that it's going to be different in a good way. That for every death, there will be a resurrection. And for every loss and failure, there will be a learning. We will look back on it kind of like, hopefully, a little bit like how I look back at losing the, the audio and video of this sermon, part of the painful learning process. But boy, am I so glad I learned that lesson so that I can live in a freer, more powerful future and present. And so my invitation to you as this Holy Week deepens and as this crisis we are in deepens, do your best to stay with Jesus at the cross of all places. I mean, ultimately, the disciples were not able to do that. Um, they, uh, it was Jesus' suffering that caused them to desert, their fear. And so I know that because the disciples couldn't, that's just a warning to us that we can't either. But do your best. I'll do my best. We'll do our best together to stay at the cross with Jesus, to return to the cross. And when we don't, when we fall short of our best, when we in fact do our worst, I want you to know Jesus is raised and he has gone ahead of you to Galilee. He has gone ahead of us to Galilee. There is where we will see him and we will see him. And we will know deep in our bones Jesus' forgiving, transforming love. Thanks be to God. Friends in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to struggle against sin, death, and the devil, everything that keeps us from loving God and loving each other. This is the struggle to which we were called in baptism. 
The struggle has been harder this year than we first thought it would be. For the sake of others, we have surrendered more than we imagined was possible. And we are caught in the tension of safeguarding the sanctity of our own life and safeguarding the sanctity of the lives of our neighbors. So now let us surrender even our sin and our whole selves, because within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving the peace of reconciliation, along with the power of transformation and change. So on this night, let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor and enter the celebration of the great three days reconciled both with God and each other. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always, and also with you. The Lord be with you. duty and delight that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you O God through Jesus Christ who bids us turn to you and prepare for the Paschal Feast and so with the church on earth all creation and the host of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is the one who comes in your name. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy lasts forever, and you are loyal from generation to generation. You created the heavens and the earth. You saved the earth from the waters of the flood. You brought the Israelites safely through the sea. You led your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. You spoke and acted in Jesus, your anointed one. You were crucified and resurrected as the Christ, and you poured out your Spirit on all nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. 
he gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and giving thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast and grace our tables with your presence. Come, Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us and send us forth burning with justice, peace, and love. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God blessed and holy trinity, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, and the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for you and for the world. And this is the blood of Christ, shed for you and for the world.
Already our sanctuary has been stripped. We have been stripped from our sanctuary. Public places stripped. Gathering places stripped. Workplaces and schools stripped. Hospitals bracing for the worst or in some places already overflowing, the worst already upon them. Many families stripped of their loved ones, their jobs, their sense of normalcy, and more. Our hearts are stripped bare, and your heart, O oh God, is stripped bare too. Your body, O oh God, was stripped. Your life, O oh God, was stripped away with us and with this world, for us and for this world. In our emptiness, reveal your salvation. Will be in God's heart. They will proclaim. 